morning and Merry Christmas. That's right. I'm Pastor Adam, and this is my beautiful wife, Carrie. On behalf of everyone here, we would like to welcome you to Christmas at One City. Our staff, our volunteers, our children, and our youth have been working diligently to prepare today's wonderful performance. They've been working so hard with anticipation of what's to come. So would you please stand with us, and together, let's celebrate the end of the anticipation and the arrival of the King. Yeah. 
we give it up for the worship team? That was incredible. Hey, once again, I just want to welcome you all to Christmas at One City. And as we take our seats, we still have guests coming in. So if you guys could move to the middle so that people can have a seat, that would be awesome. So now please turn your attention to the screen. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14.
All right. That was our preschool class, some of our tiniest members. And don't try to tell me they weren't absolutely adorable. Our next kids that are coming up are our elementary kids. Now, the song that they're going to be singing is It's Christmas. And it's a, it's a pretty exciting song. So if you get the urge to stand on your feet and dance with them, please feel free. so hard to bring you guys this song and um, it's just a, a beautiful song and I will give you a little warning disclaimer huh? I think I've cried every time that they've sang it so get your tissues ready especially if you have a kid up here um, but this is our little small group of kids singing joy to the world
I see lights all around me, trees radiating in the night. Music escapes from each house all around me, an atmosphere golden and bright. But for a moment I pause. I take a deep breath and close my eyes. I imagine over 2,000 years ago standing in a field looking up at the skies. What is Christmas? A young teenage girl is frightened. She's carrying something so heavy alone. No one around her understood, mocked, cast out. Who would have known that this young girl carried the one? Her suffering could have made her cave, but a total and utter obedience made way for him who came to save. And so one night when all was dark, unknown, mysterious, and hidden away, the greatest gift on earth arrived. After thousands of years, this was the day. In a stable, lying on the hard floor, young teenager Mary gave birth to a baby, and in that moment, life would change forevermore. His name was Jesus. All-powerful, almighty, anointed, and absolute. This was the mission he came to execute. He would be feared by many, mocked by many more, but those who were desperate, those were the ones he came for. Courageous, extraordinary, inspiring, he is love. No matter the distractions, he will forever be known as Christ, our King from above. He came for me, and he came for you. All of our flaws, our failures, he already knew. He came to bring life, and he came to bring hope. He handed us our second chance. An invitation in a simple envelope. Mighty, omnipotent, powerful, pure. Forget all the medicines. He is our ultimate cure. And so what is Christmas? It's Jesus from baby to a man. He became our mighty savior and fulfilled God's perfect plan. Without him, Christmas wouldn't exist. The greatest gift ever given would have been missed. And so this year, while festivities go on, take a moment to close your eyes and remember the one. Victorious, infallible, holy and supreme. He is the hope of the world, the greatest gift ever given. His arrival, he's come to rescue and redeem.
Come on, Merry Christmas, church. It is an honor to be with you. If you're new with us, my name is Jared. I have the honor of serving as lead pastor of One City Church. And on behalf of our entire church family, can I just take a moment and say welcome to Christmas at One City. You know, this kicks off today, but it continues into next weekend. On Christmas Eve, we have five services that day. And so choose one and consider this your personal invite to come on back, worship with us next week as well. You're going to hear all about that at the end of service. But just to get this part of the service kicked off, let me ask you a question. Have you ever struggled with doubts about all this God stuff? Like, have you ever gotten into the Christmas season? You see the lights, you see Jesus bright everywhere. And in your mind, you think, I don't even know if I believe in God. Maybe you thought to yourself, like, I know there's something bigger. I know that there's something bigger than me in the universe. I just don't know what that is. Maybe you've looked around at the brokenness of this world, the chaos, and you think to yourself, there is no way that a world this broken could be the product of a good God. You know, if you've ever thought those questions to yourself, can I just tell you, you're not alone. In fact, I want to introduce you to a man named John. He lived uh, in the early 1700s. He was from England. And, and he was actually the 15th of 19 kids, 19 children. And the mother of the home homeschooled all of them. Homeschooled all of them. You know, I got our youngest twins. They're in 10th grade. And like if they bring home a math question from school, I, I pretend to be sick. They, Dad, you help me with this homework? And I just, yeah, let me see. Oh, you're going to have to ask your mother. <laughs> you ain't going to catch me slipping. School's hard now. <laughs> so he was one of 19 kids in this, this household. And his father, uh, he was a pastor. So he was a pastor's kid. And, and he became a pastor himself. And early in his pastoral work, in his pastoral career, he started to struggle with doubt. Doubt of his faith, doubt of God just in general. And he was a pastor, so he struggled with this. And he goes to one of his good friends and he says, hey man, like this is the doubt that I'm dealing with. And his friend gave him this advice. He said, here's what you need to do. Preach faith until you have it. And then because you have it, you'll preach faith. In other words, his friend told him this, you need to fake it until you make it. You need to fake it until you make it. And John, he takes the advice. He actually begins to preach this message of faith. He's sharing something that he's not even convinced is real. And so he starts preaching. And it's one afternoon, he's speaking to a congregation. At the end of his message, a man gives his life to Christ and Uh, And John starts to watch this man's life be radically transformed. And week by week, he comes back to church and he's putting his life back together piece by piece. And with every piece that he puts back together, John becomes more discouraged. And he's like, he received the message from me. Why is he experiencing something I never had? Why is he encountering a God I've never encountered? when I was the one that told him about it. (laughs) You ever realize this, that the truth of God's word, that the power of God's word, it ain't dictated by whether or not you believe in it. What you receive from God's word is dictated by whether or not you believe in it. And so here was John speaking the word of God, but not receiving the word of God. As a pastor in front of a congregation, speaking what he should speak, but not receiving what he should receive. Sounds like a lot of churches in our country, doesn't it? Until one night, May 24th, 1738, at 845 at night, John gets invited into a church service and he goes with a friend of his. And the guy's getting ready to speak. And he's going to preach out of the book of Romans in the Bible. And before he starts preaching, he gives this introduction to the book of Romans. And look what John said when he heard this man give the introduction. John said, God showed up. I felt my heart strangely warmed. 
I felt I did trust in Christ, in Christ alone for salvation. How many know we'll put our faith in a lot of things? And then he says, and an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine. You ever hit that point where you feel like you're too broken even for God? He says that that he's taken away sins, even my sins, even my brokenness, even the things that no one else knows that I've done. Jesus takes them away. And then he says, and he saved me from the law of sin in death. In other words, John says, one night on May 24, 1738, God unexpectedly showed up. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you walk into a church and you're here for a Christmas service and you're watching people worship and you're like, what are they doing? Why are they feeling something I'm not feeling? Why are they encountering a God in a way I'm not encountering God? And if that's you, I need to say this to you, because God will show up in unexpected ways. And just because God showed up one way to one person doesn't mean that's how God's going to show up to you. Stop comparing your faith to other people's faith. That might be the start of the problem. Because for John, he encountered him deep in his pastoral path. And one night, God unexpectedly showed up, and his life changed forever. And I can tell you this, John's life is history. His full name, a man by the name of John Wesley, the leader of the Methodist movement, one of the most influential figures in early Christianity that we ever knew existed. And when he was 88 years old, he died. And it's been said that there were 130,000 people who showed up when he died and gave him personal credit for their salvation led 130,000 people to Christ, all because one day God unexpectedly showed up when he didn't expect him to be here. Church, how many know this is the message of Christmas? That 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, the Messiah unexpectedly showed up in a way no one expected him to show up. As a person, no one expected him to be. With a mission, no one expected him to have. And he would go on to accomplish things no one expected him to accomplish. And so we celebrate it, and we call it Christmas, and we celebrate the arrival of Jesus. But church, how many know The first Christmas was not the last Christmas. Another Christmas we will celebrate because Jesus will arrive once again. And so today, I want to preach a message real quick, a message that I want to call an unexpected Christmas, an unexpected Christmas. You know, typically during these types of things, we preach the story of Christmas, the famous story. Jesus in a manger and, and, and being held by Mary with animals around him and the wise men. The, the famous story out of Luke chapter 2. But today, I want to look at a different passage of Scripture. I want to look at the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. Here, Jesus is teaching his disciples that another Christmas is coming. He's teaching his disciples that even though I came once, there's another day where I will arrive once again. And the disciples, they start to ask questions. They start to say, God, or Jesus, I I hear you. I hear you saying you're coming back, but what will be the signs? What will it look like? When is all this going to go down? And here's where Jesus responds. Matthew 24, verses 36 through 44. He says this. He says, however, no one, knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people, they were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. 
In other words, another Christmas is coming. You just don't know when. He says, understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You must also be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Jesus says the last Christmas was not the last Christmas. And today I want to extract two major points from this passage of Scripture. Two points I don't want any of us to go home without. And the first one is this. God can show up in any situation. God can show up in any moment. Come on, church. How many people believe God can still show up in any moment? How many people believe God can still show up in any situation, in any person's life, even when we don't expect it? Someone needs to receive this. God still wants to do something incredible in your life. He still wants to do something incredible in you and through you. No matter how much doubt you have today, no matter how silly you think all this faith stuff is, no matter how many times you've tried to do it on your own and failed over and over and over again, I need you to hear it. God is not only ready to meet you in your chaos, he's not only ready to show up for you, but he is ready to receive you and transform the very life that you live. He wants to transform you, even when you least expect it. You know, God doesn't just show up in the extraordinary. He also shows up in the ordinary. The everyday life, the, the normal behaviors. You know, Scripture is full of stories of God showing up in the lives of people, people just doing their ordinary behavior. And then experiencing extraordinary transformation. We see it all throughout the Bible. Think about it. Acts chapter 9, we see the story of Paul on his way to Damascus, right? And he's heading to Damascus for what? To arrest followers of Jesus and to kill them. And then he encounters Jesus. And on the other side of that encounter was what? Was a man who writes two-thirds of the New Testament in the Bible. Peter. Mark chapter 1, a sinful, broken man comes into the scene to go fishing, to earn a living once again, as he always has. Except this day, he encounters Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. And on the other side of that encounter, Peter becomes one of the boldest evangelists of all time. Leads the first revival, leads the Pentecostal revival. The Samaritan woman, the one we all relate to, too broken to be accepted by where she's from, ostracized by the very community she called home, people unwilling to be around her because of her mistakes. Sounds like a lot of churches in America, doesn't it? She goes to get water outside of town when no one's around because no one will be near her except this time she encounters Jesus and Jesus sits with her and for the first time in probably a very long time he sees her as something other than broken and sinful and he speaks life to her and he tells her the water you're drawing once you drink it you will get thirsty again but the water I give you will give you life Jesus not only gives her a life-giving water, but he gives her a brand new identity. And on the other side of that encounter, he sends her back into her town with the news that the Messiah is here. That the Messiah was here. Church, hear me when I say this. Jesus not only will show up when you least expect him, but he shows up when you most need him. And when Jesus comes onto the scene, hear this, things change. When I invite Jesus into my life, my life changes. When I invite Jesus into my marriage, my marriage changes. When I bring Jesus into the chaos of my life, the chaos of my life is transformed from chaos into purpose. Why? Because when Jesus shows up, things change even if it catches you off guard. Because I understand this. Sometimes this whole faith thing can feel a little bit uncomfortable, especially when you first come into the presence of God. It was that way on the very first Christmas. 
caught people off guard. But how many know this? Sometimes the greatest gift we can receive is the one we didn't know we needed. Sometimes the greatest blessing in my life is the blessing I didn't know existed. Sometimes the greatest touch of God that I can receive in my life is a touch that I didn't know God was capable of doing. The very first Christmas brought as much uncertainty as it did rejoicing. <laughs> but when you understand that God can show up in any situation, then you can receive our second point, and it's this, that once God shows up, God doesn't leave you empty. God doesn't show up, take what he can from you, and then just leave you in the dust. I, I'll put it this way. God's different than people. God's not trying to get something out of you. God's trying to get something to you so he can get something through you. And so here we are, allowing the uncertainties of this encounter with God because it feels a little bit different because I've never gone through this before. And then in my uncertainty, in my infamiliarity, I begin to doubt. And it's not that you're doubting God. You're doubting that if God's real, then you're going to start doubting yourself. You know, I remember our girls, our young girls, uh, our, one of them, the twins, she was the one over here that had the kids hanging on her neck when she was on the stage. Uh, they're, they're 15 now. Uh, and, and when they were two years old, we had Christmas, and Danielle and I, we got them this little slide that you could just put anywhere in the living room. It was probably about this tall, and they could just slide down it. And we were stoked about it. Like, Danielle and I, we were excited about this gift. And so we wrap it up. It's Christmas morning. We pull out this big box, and, and it's wrapped up. And the girls, they see it, and their eyes light up. And, and, and they start to tear open the paper. And Zoe, she sees this slide, and she gets amped up, boy. She is like, she wants to get it out of the box, put it together in the living room. She wants to be sliding down the slide yesterday. And then Isabella, she also sees this, and she gets excited. And Danielle and I, we're like, here it comes. Like, they're excited. And she looks, and she says, look, a box. <laughs> I, I, said, well, I, I said, yeah, but Bud, we call her Bud. I said, Bud, but there's a slide in the box. And she said, Dad, look at this box. <laughs> and I'm like, Get in the box, right? Like, I, I, at that point, I remember thinking to myself in that moment, I spent every penny I had to get these sh kids gifts. I could have went to U-Haul with $35, <laughs> bought five empty boxes, and been a hero <laughs> for Christmas that year. But how many know this? Sometimes the box can be more attractive than the gift. You know, Danielle, the mother of those kids... <laughs> She has this gift uh, in her life. She's just an incredible decorator. She just does great with that. She decorates everything. She decorated the stage. Um, she decorates everything at the house. She decorates just anything that needs decorated. And during this time of year, uh, she gets to use these right here. I pulled this, I pulled this out of my, my, under my Christmas tree right now. And they're these decorative boxes, and they're great. They're beautiful. They, you can do anything with them. You can hide wires behind the tree, set stuff on top of them. They're just, they're just solid. These are like the, the throw pillow of Christmas. You know what I'm saying? Like these just work in all kinds of capacities. Now, even though it's beautiful, here's the problem with it. Is that when you open it, it's empty. And so the box is great until I have an expectation for it. The box is great until I expect something to be inside of it, at which time the most useful part of the box is going to waste. See, I don't get a gift from somebody and they give me a gift and then the next time I see them, I say, hey, just wanted to thank you for that box. No, I say what? Thank you for the gift because it's what's inside of the box that holds the significance. It's not about what's in the external, it's about what's in the internal. How many know this? I can make my life look as pretty as I need to make it look. I can make my life look as stunning as I want it to look. But if I don't start filling my life up with what's important, if I don't start filling my life up with the presence of God, if I don't start allowing the arrival of Jesus to transform me from empty to full, hear me, church, you're walking around as a decoration. 
You're not being used for the purpose you were created to be used. You're walking around empty. You want people to see you're pretty. You want it to look like you're pretty, but inside it's empty. That wasn't God's plan for your life. If you open up the box of your life and all it is is empty, you're missing the point of life. I want to open the box of my life and I want to find things there. Starting with freedom. Freedom from the things that try to get me out of my purpose. I want to open the box of my life and I want to find the life that God intended for me to have. I want to find the fruit of the Spirit. I want to open the box of my life and I want to experience love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. I want all of that inside of me, not exterior of me. I want to open the life, the box of my life and, and I want to find Jesus. I don't want to walk around. just looking the part and trying to get people to believe that I'm filled with something that doesn't exist inside of you. Come on, church. Come on, I just believe that right now in this place, in this moment, there are people and you're sick of being empty. You're sick of living a life that has to look one way while you feel another. You're sick of trying to, to, to look the part instead of feel the part. You're sick of living a life that is empty, but it looks good to everyone around you. How many know too many of us walk into church like this? Too many of us come into God's house and we put everything together on the outside. But every time we open up our lives, it's empty. It's fruitless. That wasn't what it was intended for you. That wasn't your life. That's the enemy lying to you, getting you to believe. That's your life. You know what the best part about Christmas is? It means that the transformation that you know you want in your life, it means you don't have to wait for New Year's. You don't have to wait to make a New Year's resolution to start changing your life. You can start right now, right in this place, right in this moment. Do you know why? Because God shows up in the unexpected times of our lives. And when he shows up, things change. And when things change, my life starts to get transformed. And when my life starts to get transformed, I step into the purpose God has for me. And I promise you this, the purpose God has for you is better than the purpose you have for you. An unexpected Christmas is coming, church. The question is when it comes, do you want to be full of the presence of God or do you want to still be a decoration that's empty? Would you stand with me? Just stand with me in this moment. I want to take a moment. I want to pray together. And then I want to just sing one more song together. But here's what I want to speak to someone. I want to speak this. If your life feels empty, don't walk out of here still with it empty. Church, you don't need to wait. I know you might not have this whole faith thing figured out. I know there might still be some things that feel out of whack or, or, or unique. But today's the day of changes. Amen? Come on, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, I thank you for your presence here today. I thank you that you meet us in the middle of all circumstance, Jesus. Right now, Father, I just pray that you would show up in the lives of your people in a supernatural way. Jesus, if anyone in this room is walking around this world empty, I pray you would give them a touch of your spirit to know that they can be filled in this moment. And maybe you're in this place now and you walked in for whatever reason you walked in to see a production, to see a child that you know, to see a friend that you know, whatever the case may be. And right now you just are realizing I'm living an empty life. I, if that's you, I want to give you the opportunity to come into a relationship with Jesus. I just believe right now God's speaking to people. I believe there's people in this room, in this moment, who no longer want to just look the part, they want to feel the part. 
And so if that's you, with all eyes closed, all heads bowed, I'm going to count to three. I just want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come up. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I just want you to have a moment with Jesus. I want you to say, Jesus, I am ready for you. I am ready to be filled with you. I am ready to have the presence of the Holy Spirit guide my life. So with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, if that's you, and you want to start that relationship with Jesus, and you no longer want to live an empty life but a fulfilled life, then on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three, raise your hand. You see your hands, 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 you see your hands. You can put your hand down. Father, we thank you for every hand raised right now. We thank you not just because the kingdom is expanded. We thank you because we know transformation is coming to those people. We know that a brand new life is accessible to them, that the old is gone, that the labels are gone, that the, con the, the condemnation is gone, and the new has come. And if you raised your hand, we want to pray with you, but here at One City, no one's ever going to pray alone, so let's pray this prayer together. Say, Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe you sent your Son, Jesus, to take my place on the cross, to die, to be buried, and to rise again so my relationship with you can be restored. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Therefore, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. And everyone said amen and amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. You can do better than that. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. The emptiness is gone. Come on, we're going to worship together. We love you. We'll see you next week. When I just sang another song, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Lord, I'm sorry when I come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot. You're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here at your feet.
I love what that song says. It says, I'm sorry for showing up with my own agenda. And I know a lot of people might have shown up with the agenda of just coming to a Christmas show, but got to experience Christ today. People that showed up empty are going to leave full. And that's what it's all about. Amen. Would y'all just please take your seat? And as you do, can we just give honor to everybody that's put a ton of time into day, making today so special? Well, my name is Daniel Solis, and I'm Discipleship Director here at One City Church. And first-time guests, in the seat back pocket in front of you, you're going to find our connection card. Can you go ahead and grab that? Because when you fill this out, you're making a huge difference. And let me tell you why. For every first-time guest card that we receive, we're going to be making a donation to fight homelessness in this area. So you might just see a card, but this isn't just the card. This is a blanket that's going to keep somebody warm. This is a hot meal that's gonna feed somebody that's hungry. This is an opportunity to pour into a community that is hurting. Oh, you thought I was just another church asking you to fill out a car. No, 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 no. I'm telling you how you're about to make an impact on this place where transformation starts. So if you would please fill that out at the end of service, you can drop it in the offering bins or you could take it to the Discover One City table and we have a special gift for you. Sound good? I know that was a lot. Almost got fired up right there. Did you guys enjoy today, though? Was it awesome? Listen, it doesn't have to stop here, though. Next week, it's Christmas Eve at One City, and we have five services, 9, 10, 30, 12, 3, and 5. We want to give you a special invite to come back out and experience the presence of Jesus on Christmas Eve here at One City Church. 
Lastly, let's go ahead and receive our tithes and offerings. There's multiple ways to give. They're all behind me on the screen. You can text one city to 94,000. You can use the church center app. You can use the cash app handle one city church. You can go to weareonecity.com or you can drop it in the offering bins in the back. Can I go ahead and pray? Lord, we just thank you for this day, Father. We thank you that you never leave us empty and that you always show up when we show up. Father, thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for the transformation that you're about to have in people's lives. Father, I pray over, over every person here, God, that you protect them throughout this week. Lord, thank you for every gift that we're about to receive and every generous heart giving it. Father, we trust you that you're gonna use it to transform this community. Lord, we love you and we honor you and give you all the praise in the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you so much for coming. We love you guys. We can't wait to see you next week for Christmas Eve at One City Church. Thank you.